Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, in fact, my brief said uh, anesthetic implications for minimally invasive cardiac surgery, which I think will be quite a large topic. And since in the interest of time, and this is a mitral valve meeting, so we'll, I'll stick to the mitral valve surgery. Uh, this is my place of work. Uh, it's a few years old. It has expanded even more. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, the areas that I'd, I would like to expand on uh, are on this, on this list. Uh, some areas have been covered. Uh, so in the, again, in the interest of time, I can skip over. And I'm not going to go into any detail on TOE because that is the next, next topic. One thing which strikes uh, from this list and the, any anesthetist in the audience will agree with me, is that all of these areas actually are part of our daily cardiothoracic anesthetic practice. Um, the difference here is that there is a slight variation when it comes to minimally invasive mitral valve surgery, and there is a difference in degree as to how, how uh, vigilant you need to be, how proficient you need to be in TOE. So, my aim will be to, to try and highlight those uh, variations and the, and the degree and give you some uh, tips and tricks uh, from my uh, unit's experience of, of nearly 300 cases. Uh, so, <coughs> lung isolation, as we've seen, is, is uh, essential. The choice could be a, a double lumen endotracheal tube or a bronchial blocker used with a single lumen tube. Um, again, I'm not here to, to, to teach or to, to, uh, to convey, uh, to sway you one way or the other, um, but um, my own practice and most of the other people I know uh, would use a double lumen tube. Uh, if given a choice, we would all view, always use a left double lumen tube, which avoids the the problem with the right upper lobe. But in fact, here you could make, uh, make a case for either, um, and I'll point out later why. Uh, the advantage with bronchial blocker is that at the end of the case, uh, you then do not have to, to change the double lumen tube to a single before transferring to the intensive care unit. Uh, the disadvantage I find is that, again, especially if the right upper, bron upper lobe bronchus takeoff is a bit early, uh, it is, becomes a bit difficult to place. Um, it's either too far in uh, into the intermediate bronchus or it slips out and, uh, uh, and, it, and it's too far out. Again, as an anesthetist, I don't need to go into the details of steps to combat hypoxia on one lung. Um, there is a whole list uh, and then we would go through all that. Uh, two things I will mention here, and again, it goes back to the right and the left tube. Uh, if I've come across at least twice this situation that everybody knows about the right upper lobe bronchus coming off early, but sometimes the left can divide early as well. And I've seen where uh, people have been struggling really with oxygenation, and then on endoscopic examination, you find that the left-sided tube is actually into the left lower lobe bronchus. And so the right side, it, uh, three lobes are down intentionally, and out of the two left, one is down unintentionally, and, and, and you struggle. And, and that's where if you had a right-sided tube, then the ventilation to your left side will be quite free. The other thing is that if you're really struggling, uh, is early institution of cardiopulmonary bypass uh, to get around that. Um, because the usual sequence will be that the surgeons will explore the groin vessels, make sure that they are okay, then move to the chest and do all the dissection there, and then go back to the cannulation. And if you are struggling with one lung ventilation and you've done everything you can, uh, and in, in discussion with your surgeon, the, the solution could be to, to stop the, uh, or delay the, uh, chest dissection uh, and institute cardiopulmonary bypass early. Uh, 
that will also cause you a problem at the end of the case. And again, I would, uh, amongst the anesthetists, I would ask you to persuade your surgeon to finish everything or almost as much possible hemostasis and other things before coming off bypass so that you come off bypass on two lungs and if you have to go back for the final look, it should be a very brief one because that is not the time uh, that you, uh, you need to face hypoxia in terms of uh, especially uh, right ventricular function when you've just had a long bypass and you, you're coming off. You have to change a double limb tube at the end of the, end of the case. Uh, again, a bit of caution there. In cases where the intubation has been a bit traumatic and there will be a lot of movement of the TOA probe in and out, uh, in cases where the uh, head and neck venous drainage may have been less than ideal, there may be some edema in the oropharynx and in the larynx. So the, when you're changing the tube, uh, do it under good direct vision, uh, making sure that you can, there is no swelling, you can actually see the larynx, or if there's any doubt, uh, do it over a bougie or an exchange catheter. Uh, patient positioning uh, has been mentioned. Um, what is required is a supine position uh, with a right chest uh, higher or a left lateral tilt. And the right arm needs to be slightly extended uh, and forearm flexed. The idea is to expose the right hemithorax down to the mid axillary line and, and the groins. There is a potential for nerve injury, there are long cases and especially the arm hanging down um, could, be, uh, could be a potential cause. Uh, generous padding should be used, and obviously uh, don't, don't forget the external defibrillation pads. And in fact, we have made it part of our uh, WHO checklist. Uh, this is the position that you'll end up with. Um, the You have to be careful uh, as to how you raise the left chest. Here you can see that uh, a, probably a three liter bag has been used, uh, which can be inflated, which is sitting under the right shoulder or right scapula. Uh, this is not a, a photograph from my institution. Um, uh, I'd, I ha will have concerns about this arm hanging down like this, which has a potential for traction on, on, on nerves. Um, if, if this is used, this should, the elbow should be supported uh, to take the pressure of the, of the, of the brachial plexus. Now, the, enough has been said about the two types of uh, uh, methods of aortic occlusion. Um, I would only point out the bit that are relevant uh, as an anesthetist for, for monitoring. Now the intraaortic device, now called the intraclude, uh, because of its potential for migration distally and including head and neck vessels, uh, bilateral uh, upper arm arterial pressure monitoring is required. Accurate placement is essential with TOE guidance. Now a bit more on, on, on the next slide about accurate placement. Um, the uh, it has a tendency to move because you can imagine there are uh, several different forces working on it. The, the retrograde bypass is, is pushing the cannula uh, proximally into the, into the ventricle. When you start to give cardioplegia, there is a rebound effect and it tends to move back and which may counteract, but once you stop giving cardioplegia and start the procedure, it may slowly move towards the ventricle. When you start giving cardioplegia, obviously the heart is still beating, so there is a tendency uh, for it to move, um, and a few tricks have been, um, adenosine has already been mentioned by Dr. Dishpande, and I've also seen uh, a bolus of potassium being used. Um, adenosine, I don't, I don't mind. Potassium, I don't like. Um, 
Adenosine is very short acting. You can, you can straight away see uh, and that it'll go. The, the problem, my problem with potassium is, is that I would, I would like to see the heart arrest from core cardioplegia and not potassium and then heart, heart arresting, but you, know, you do not know whether your cardioplegia delivery has been uh, adequate and whether the heart is arrested and cold or whether it is still the ongoing effect of potassium. Um, the monitoring of intraclude during bypass is, is very uh, essential and I'll, I'll come back to it. When you're using direct clamp, only one arterial line is enough. Uh, you have to be a bit careful with your right internal jugular line that it is not too far in. You've seen several videos uh, how, the, uh, how the direct clamp is placed. Uh, the surgeon has to maneuver making sure uh, that you're not catching the primary artery, you're not catching the left atrial appendage, and you almost have to sort of negotiate over the SVC. And if you've got your cannula in there and made it rigid, uh, the surgeon may find uh, a bit more difficult to, to, uh, to negotiate that. Uh, additional catheters uh, have already been mentioned that there are two arterial lines if you're using intraclude. If you're using uh, the right internal jugular SVC drainage catheter. Size, anything between 14 to 17 is used. In our unit, we use 15 French. Uh, Heparinization, two methods being used. Um, once all the wires are in, uh, before putting the cannula, you can give a small dose, uh, 5,000, 7,000, or 100 units per kilo, um, or you can, once the cannula is in, you can actually infuse a small continuous drip into the SVC cannula to keep it patent until you are ready to use it. Uh, insertion kit, unfortunately, with it is, is not ideal. It is the same as the long venous cannula with a very long wire. Uh, insertion length we have already talked about, and some, uh, some centers may use the additional uh, catheters uh, to deliver retrograde cardioplegia or to use endopulmonary vent. Uh, TUE, I'm not going to go into detail, but again, uh, a detailed baseline uh, examination, uh, catheter positioning, and monitoring during, cardiopulmonary, uh, during cardioplegia delivery that I've already mentioned. Uh, so, ideally, uh, Sorry, does this have a point? Oh, yes. Um, ideally, you would want it just above the uh, sinus tubular junction, uh, but obviously below the nominate, and you're monitoring the two arterial lines. Uh, it would be nice to see it's nicely positioned and cardioplegia being delivered. Uh, an important thing to say here, during bypass, if this thing moves, um, it is very difficult to, to monitor that. So, uh, two things I would say. One, uh, during cardioplegia delivery, um, as Dr. Deshpande already said, the thing is to be patient. They, they, Sometimes there is a tendency that while the cardioplegia is still being delivered, the heart has stopped, is to open the left atrium. Uh, the whole thing collapses, the, the, the picture disappears, and it's very difficult to then monitor. So uh, you should encourage uh, your surgeon not to open the left atrium until all plegia has been delivered. And in fact, deliv delivery has been stopped to make sure that the catheter then doesn't move. During bypass, the only way you can find that this has moved distally, if, uh, approximately. Distally, if it moves, you can see on the arterial lines. But if it moves proximally, then the clue, or the first clue, is that you have good communication with your perfusionist. The first thing they will notice is that if it falls into the coronary sinus, uh, there is more room and the pressure drops in the balloon. Their tendency will be to give a uh, bit more saline, to keep the pressure up, and they would keep doing that until it falls into the... So it's very important to keep that communication, or they should know that if they are having to keep adding 
small bits of volume, because the pressure in the balloon is dropping, uh, you must check with the theory that it has not moved into the coronary sinuses or, in fact, into the left ventricle, which I have seen both. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's obvious, evaluation of repair, and I'm not going to go into detail because it will be, it'll be covered later. Um, vigilance is, is essential, so less coffee times and more time in theater, I'm afraid. Um, catheter displacement, I've already mentioned arterial trace, if you're using an uh, endoclamp, uh, two arterial traces, intraclute pressure monitoring and liaising with your perfusionist that the, the pressure is not changing and he's not quite, he or she is not quietly putting in, putting in more volume. Uh, and theory to, to check that. But the only way you have left is, is the left ventricle. Um, SVC drainage, uh, again, um, intermittently you must check the head and neck area that there is, uh, there is no suffusion. Okay. Uh, and during long bypass, uh, the heparinization should be kept an eye on, especially if you're using ACT. Um, because the correlation, as you know, between heparin dose and ACT is not as, as linear. Teamwork is vital, and uh, surgeon needs to scrub perfusion, I've already mentioned, acute communication. Not only WHO checklist at the start, but a debriefing of the case at the end, and, and, and we, we have this system in place. If there's, if there's any problem, we do a root cause analysis, and then, then the whole group meets. Uh, as to what, what happened and what, how it can be avoided in future. Post-op analgesia, I'm not going to go into detail. It's already been mentioned that at the end of the day, it is a thoracotomy. It has got thoracotomy pain, and for the first 24, 36 hours, it is hardly any different to, to a stenotomy. Uh, I'm not a fan of epidurals in, in, in cardiac surgery, but it has been used. Our own practice is to do either an extrapural catheter or, in, or a direct vision paravert and the intercostal blocks, and then morphine infusion and PCA. Thank you. Sorry.